major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Food sponsors for Ableton On Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene's not here today. On this um, fabulous edition of Ableton On Air, we would like to thank Washington County Mental Health and our many other sponsors for sponsoring Ableton On Air. And on this edition, we speak about how COVID-19 is dealing with the mental health community. With me um, to discuss this important topic is Mary Kay Casper, Keith Greer, Mary Moulton, and John uh, John Severus. Please excuse me if I um, if I mispronounce your name. Welcome all to Ableton on Air. How how are you guys doing? Doing well, Lawrence. Thank you. How are okay. you? Okay. Good. Good. Um, so let's begin, um, Mary. How exactly? Um, has the mental health community been dealing with COVID-19? I know it's been a little bit, um, you know, messy with uh, services and so on. Go ahead. Well, um, I think you, you asked Lawrence how exactly, and it, this is such an inexact uh, type of response because COVID-19 took over our lives now, I cannot believe, uh, almost a year ago. And so um, I'm glad I have my colleagues on to speak about that as they work in the field. But uh, we've been all hands on deck and the primary thing we needed to address when this all started was communication around safety around the virus itself for all of our clients and staff and home providers and families. And so uh, that was our first priority. And we continue to do that to this day, because as you know, the information on how to best be safe throughout this time evolved. So. We did that, and I think all of those that we serve paid attention to that too. And in, of course, the mix of that is, our, is, is everyone's mental health. And so mm -hmm. your question is right on target because um, that is, it almost got put to the side as we, as we looked at how we take care of ourselves physically, not for us. We, we tended to meeting with people and we were very aware of how much this would affect mental health for people with uh, previous mental health conditions, no mental health conditions previously, and with people with developmental disabilities and autism. We knew that isolation um, was going to have a big effect. So from the beginning, we did everything we could to reach out and help people to feel less isolated. A lot of different ways we did that, which we're happy to talk about today. Okay, so why don't we uh, start by talking about some of those um, services and how your services have changed uh, with uh, COVID. So I wonder if I might pass the hat to one of my colleagues to talk about that. Go ahead. Whoever wants to jump in. I'm happy to start. My, my name is Keith Greer. I'm the director of the Community Support Program here at Washington County Mental Health. And we serve about 360 individuals uh, who experience um, major mental illness. Um, the vast majority of the individuals we serve in the community. Uh, so, and we have a variety of sites, including Heaton Street, which is where I'm at right now. Uh, and several residential programs and a day program uh, where we serve people in the community. And the first thing that we experienced when COVID, this was back in, in March, 
was we had to reduce our footprint. So we had to sort of um, stop seeing people in the way that uh, we had previously been seeing people. And that, that had a profound uh, impact on the people we serve. You know, we talk about this notion of isolation uh, and loneliness and disconnection uh, that COVID uh, has, has sort of brought about. But isolation, loneliness, and disconnection existed pre-COVID uh, for many of the people that we serve. Uh, living in the community. So it exacerbated the, the condition in, in, in many, many uh, ways. So to ameliorate or to, to help sort of create connection in this environment where disconnection and, and isolation um, really sort of ramped up. Uh, so we had to stop doing our, our day programming just because we couldn't have congregate uh, care. We couldn't have a bunch of people in the same place at the same time for very good reason, right? We don't, we, it's, we consider it our responsibility to help stop the spread. Uh, so because we had to close down those services, what we've been doing is we uh, adopted rather rapidly uh, telehealth uh, uh, services. So we went from, and John has the, has the numbers on these, but as an organization, we went from like doing what? A thousand hours of uh, Zooming to like 250,000 hours of Zooming in a matter of I think, a couple of weeks. Uh, so we did that sort of in terms of outreach, but not everybody that we serve uh, has the ability to do telehealth, i.e. they don't have the, either the devices or the know-how or whatever. So we started doing a lot of outreach uh, from our uh, day program. So we delivered meals, uh, we delivered information, including sort of brochures and information on uh, COVID-19 and how people could take care of themselves. Uh, and we really started to do that. We ramped that up pretty much immediately within a week of closing down our sunrise day program, we started doing a lot more outreach. We're also doing a lot more calls out to individuals. Uh, we have a, a really robust peer support network and we uh, mobilized our peer support to sort of start doing call outs and outreach to people at night because of that isolation and, and loneliness that people uh, are experiencing. I'm really proud of those services that we've been able to uh, afford to the folks that we serve. So those are some ways that we have changed uh, in the context of COVID. Thanks for letting me share. Because, because uh, in my experience, being challenged in the way that I'm challenged, telehealth doesn't work in every single instance. Okay, um, um, you know, it, um, it works um, for most people, but some people need that one-on-one. -on -one issue like for for me for example uh, going to my epilepsy doctor I still do because tele telehealth doesn't really work in that way but you know hopefully we can get back to quote unquote normal I mean it's I know it's still a new normal but um, it, do you agree that telehealth doesn't work in in every instance Anyone? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Lawrence. We learned, we, we knew that, we learned it further on who it works for. And so, you know, what we apply is if a person needs to actually be seen face to face, we do that. And of course, now, uh, start actually starting in the summer, we were much more back out seeing people and, uh, and we um, were in back in the community much more so than um, using telehealth. But then we had the surge so for some uh, instances, we, we retracted a little, and now we're, um, we're getting back out there again. I want to give Mary Kay an opportunity to respond, too. Go ahead. Lawrence, thank you for asking me to be a part of this. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate being able to talk about developmental services. Like Keith and Mary have said, um, isolation is is overwhelming for our folks living with developmental disabilities and autism. And from the very beginning, we were really concerned because it's really important for folks to be connected to each other, to see faces, to be in the same room, mm -hmm. to socialize, to network. Yep. A lot of folks are friends with each other. And when COVID happened, this kind of blew everything out of the water and made it very difficult to provide those kind of services. Mm -hmm. And for also our people that 
work out that have jobs out there. Many of them lost their jobs or had their jobs put on hold until it was safe to go. But what's really important to know is that some of our people still got to work because we still have staff that are willing to work face to face and that want to help out and keep having folks be successful in their employment areas. We also have a lot of our staff that uh, in the very beginning, we couldn't actually go in houses and meet with folks or, you know, have those one on one meetings in the building. And oftentimes folks would actually stand at the go and stand at the end of a driveway and wave at folks or drive by their house just to see another face, to see somebody that really cares about them. So we really tried to find unique and diverse ways to connect with with our folks. What I also want to say is with, with the learning collaborative, you know, that was we had to shut it down. We couldn't have it be face to face. But what we decided to do another way to connect, we had a newsletter that went out to everybody that talked about all the issues that came up with also also things like activities and knowledge that we wanted to give out to people that we normally do when we're in the learning collaborative classes. The other thing we decided to do is do online classes too. Mm -hmm. So our staff put together regular classes every day that were available for folks to attend online. And like Ben said, not everybody has internet. And that's something we really are working hard to advocate with the government about, to make sure that everybody has access. Well, well, so in other words, you're going to be giving everybody a computer who doesn't have one? Or... Oh, I wish I could do that. Yes, that would be great. What we did do, though, is uh, buy tablets, small tablets that we gave to folks who, that did come to us and say they don't have a computer. So that was one way we offered that that service to folks is and then we got them on zoom that way so yeah some folks i wish we could give computers to everybody but we don't have that ability um the other thing that we're doing is and that we did this year is we had um activities outside where we would have drive-by um one of our staff it was his birthday so we had a big birthday party and everybody came in their cars and we had cupcakes and and gifts and we put up signs and folks came in their cars and drove by and we gave them food and candy and folks really loved doing that and they got to see each other mm-hmm. unfortunately it's winter time so we can't do that and the other thing that we're doing now is putting together recorded classes and we're asking staff if they would like to come in and record classes so that folks can, whenever they want to, get on YouTube and find the classes from Washington County at the Learning Collaborative and see their staff member or see um, have have an opportunity to do a class on different um, activities and academics and physical fitness that they wouldn't normally get when they came in. So those are some of the that we're trying and we're always looking for ideas from folks in terms of how to get the word out and how to get connected to each other. Now, as far as COVID and everybody's mental health needing to be in check because of what's going on, um, what are some of the ways that Washington County is really helping people? Uh, because go, going back to that WCAX report, way back when you guys were interviewed about, uh, you know, uh, mental health and COVID. Uh, What are some of the ways that Washington County is really helping with that? Um, Sure, Lawrence, I'll I'll respond there. We've been um, pretty active letting people know to call us. We have a 24 seven line, Mm -hmm. which is uh, area code 802-229-0591. Yes. And we have encouraged people um, to give a call if they're feeling stress and anxiety. And we absolutely have seen increases in anxiety. Right now, we have more people coming in our doors than we can um, serve immediately. We do them in for emergency services, but then for ongoing therapy, we have a bit of a wait list now because we just need more capacity to um, to be able to uh, 
give people that ongoing therapy. However, um, we're going to see more of this, and this is going to be a pressure for us all around the state because the stress of um, of isolation, the stress uh, that people experienced in not being able to gather, to visit with their friends, to have, uh, you know, it may be devices or other means to connect um, has really added up. So, uh, so we're there, we're there 24 uh, seven, picking up the phone 24 seven, if people need to speak um, and actually seeing them if they need to be seen in an urgent or emergent situation. We also do a lot, as Mary Kay was saying, we do a lot of um, communicating and educating, you know, by sending out newsletters and showing videos on self care. Here's some tips on how to take care of yourself, you know, get outside, um, you know, what, think about what you would like to do and do one thing for yourself today in self-care, uh, you know, self-care in terms of, I'm sorry, so, self-care, yeah, self- self-care in terms of what, how is self-care helping uh, within this? Well, if, you know, I think if you, this type of environment where you're just staying inside, if a person just stays inside becomes unhealthy. If you just stay inside and watch the television, that's not going to be the healthiest place for your mind, for you to feel better. And you could get depressed and you can get anxious. So what we're encouraging is that people actually look outside to, uh, to take care of themselves a little bit, if they can take a walk, get out in the air, Um, you know, think about things that help them to feel good, make their own list of things that have helped them feel good in the past and try to do one of those things every day. So that's the type of tips that um, when someone calls, they'll get what's making you feel anxious. Let's talk about that. Now let's talk about how you cope with that and what we can come up with together to help you to follow through with some things that um, will actually improve the way you're feeling. So, you know, uh, I we are seeing people we haven't seen before um, at all coming through our doors, a lot of new people. So what we know is that the pandemic it ha- affects us all. It affects our mental health. It makes us feel insulated sometimes and frustrated that we can't just go and do what we want to do. We used to be hop in your car and go see a friend. And now, you know, we're being told, no, you can't do that. Or if you do that, you have to wear a mask. If I were in a room right now at my office, I would, you know, I was with someone else in the room, I would have a mask on. These changes are difficult for us. And although they've become a new norm, we are all wanting to get back speaking about to the new, way it was. <laughs> speaking about new norm, a lot of stores have closed. Uh, 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 in um, the Berlin Mall, you know, it's very little people in there now. I mean, there's Walmart, but that's about it. Well, and there you bring up the stressors of, you know, families, people and individuals who have lost their jobs, you know, Mm -hmm. um, families who have had kids home and they're trying to do their work at home because they can't go into work, plus help with their kids homework that are, you know, they're, they're multitasking all the time. So, you know, we have to watch for that as individuals, how much are we letting that pressure cooker build up and how we let off steam during the day so that it doesn't back up on us. That's about take that self-care. That's about kind of catching it before it turns into before the flame ignites. Right. And, um, you know, we speaking find about very- speaking about flame and all of you guys can chime in here. Um, I know that Gary Gordon has been on our show numerous times. Um, how has crisis intervention stuff? Uh, how has that been during the pandemic? Has there been more help with that? Has there been more staff with that? Um, et cetera, et cetera. If I, if I said the wrong thing or the wrong que- or the wrong way in the question is, let me know. I, I'm going to pop in first because I'm probably closest to that particular division, then let others speak. But um, we haven't had any more staff 
but those folks have been very, very busy. And in the beginning, we didn't see a lot of people coming up and accessing emergency services or the emergency room. Now we are because people, as I said, put their mental health aside to take care of their physical health. And now that team is extremely busy around the clock. Yeah, it's, um, Anybody else want to chime in with that? Well, I, I just kind of wanted to reflect on, on you know, you asked initially about like how, how we're sort of communicating stuff. And, um, you know, the resources we have here are pretty amazing agency wide. Uh, right from the get go, um, you know, we, we actually built a website that actually directed, not built a website, but within our website, we have a dedicated COVID page uh, that talks about COVID itself, explains what it is, you know, to help. Um, manage some of the stressors so that people had a better understanding of it. In addition to that, there were self-help op, um, uh, guides there, if you will, um, you know, resources that we had links to that would provide opportunities for self-help, uh, things for kids uh, to go on tours that were somewhat school-based uh, to try to create as much normalcy as we could. Um, we also sent out emails uh, to our, our, um, our clients as well as a snail mail to let them know what to expect. So, you know, connections are a lot of what we're about and, and that helps to, um, you know, clearly help people get through this. And so um, that was all a part of it. Um, and we've continually sent out, you know, whether it was via snail mail or emails, communicating with our, with our clients as well as staff on what to expect. Um, additionally, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned the WCAX piece that we did back, I guess it was in April was the first time we've done that. And we were fortunate enough to be able to have a couple of interviews that basically said, we're still here. You know, we're here to help. Here's what to expect. Here's how to get a hold of us. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, we've recently done some, some uh, advertising um, that is uh, via streaming media um, as well as radio. So somewhat traditional. Uh, where again, we're reinforcing that message. We're identifying the fact that people are struggling right now. Um, and if you, uh, uh, if you also, I mean, and we can discuss that later on. If you want us to run some of those PSAs that you guys been running, just let us know. Um, but um, now, as far as the vaccine, here's the here's the situation here. Vermont has been slow with giving the vaccine when other people have been getting it faster. Do you know anything as far as like how has the mental health is the mental health community giving the vaccine faster than some other folks or um, vice versa? Does anybody you understand um, the question? I guess I can pop in there. Um, so the hospital is the uh, lead for vaccine for our mental health workers. We've had a very good experience um, and they're very organized and we have almost half of our um, half of our staff that are doing face to face work have received vaccines right now. Um, and we are currently having the uh, licensed residential homes that we have where we help mm -hmm. folks. Um, and uh, Keith and Mary Kay could perhaps speak more of this, but I believe it's this week and next week, both both staff and clients receiving vaccines. So it's going very well. Um, you know, our general population, it's all in phases, um, is still uh, is beginning to come on, I believe, with over 75-year-olds. And those, uh, and those next with um, uh, severe ment medical conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard a number actually, and I, and it might have been on BPR recently, where about two hundred thousand folks in Vermont, so about a third of our entire population. Um, high because Vermont, population. I think Vermont has what six hundred fifty thousand people. Exactly, Lawrence. And so my understanding is about. 200,000, I think it's roughly about 230,000 have already received the vaccine. So given, you know, a third of the population, well. had it, it, that's not so bad, I, I think. So, in, you know, in the critical care people, frontline workers, et cetera, uh, emergency, emergency Does care. Does anybody, does Mary Kay or uh, Keith want to jump in with that? 
Sure. Staff, my staff are reporting that the, the process of getting the uh, vaccine is going really, really well. To Mary's point, we have a great relationship with the hospital here and um, things are going well. And in, in regards to like side effects or anything like that, we're hearing very little um, about that, that some staff are reporting like that some mild side effects. But other than that, uh, I think, what, 300, Mary, was the number we heard on uh, Wednesday in terms of our direct support staff. Uh, 300 staff have gotten their first vaccine, and we're really grateful that the residents of our uh, licensed homes are getting uh, vaccinated as well. So things are going uh, well. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, thus far in the responsiveness and uh, the process itself. Um, Mayor Kate Casper, do you want to um, add to that? Sure. I mean, I I want to repeat what Keith and Mary has said. Um, we feel like staff are, that work face-to-face -face with their consumers are getting vaccinated and it's happening quickly so that they can be out with them and our, our residentials are getting that, all, um, all those done there. So that's feeling really good. And the other thing is for our area, we're working with the GMSA because they do have information that's being given out to all our consumers that within the state that ha that live with developmental dis disabilities and autism to really explain what the vaccine is. And what's really great for us is that one of the things that I didn't say that we're doing is going to everybody's home and giving them a bag of all kinds of fun things, but also about, yeah, you, you saw that. I want um, a bag of fun <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, our project bags, but it, but what's also in them is self care and information, information such as about the vaccine. So we're getting to people um, directly to give them the information that they need to make sure they're taking care of themselves and they're getting. Well, what, what kind of fun stuff do you put in there? Like, um, talk about fun stuff for a minute. What, so, what are you putting in there? Like coloring books or. Uh, yeah. Pens, pencils, doodling pads, stuff like that, or? Right, we, each bag that we send out every other week is a theme. And so our first theme was all about art and crafts. And so we had magic markers and colored pencils and pages to do coloring and drawing. We also put in notes from staff to say hello. Um, we also Put in because it was the holidays, something related to the holidays. We're also doing a, a self-care package that has a stress ball in it and little widgets and some other activities. We're also doing one, you know how the Learning Collaborative does all these activities around personal care. So we're going to do all these uh, products that are related to personal care and meditation things and all kinds of fun stuff that can help folks to take care of themselves. Likewise, in CSP from our from our day program, we're so we've been sending out uh, care packages, which include food. I, I sort of want to call out that many individuals uh, have been experiencing food insecurity, so mm -hmm. we're doing our best uh, to sort of meet people uh, in the community, and bring them food. But but as important as the food is this notion of connection, and we're bringing information out about uh, COVID nineteen and the vaccines. Uh, like Mary Kay said, it's really important uh, in regards to our connection with the people that we serve, uh, information, um, food, and fun stuff. We're, too, we're doing meditation packages and um, mandalas. Do you guys know what mandalas are? Yeah, okay. Uh, what is that? <laughs> mandalas are, uh, I liken it to like an adult uh, coloring book with really neat um, uh, designs and uh, colorful uh, figures that people can sort of color in, and it, it can be a meditative uh, practice. Mm -hmm. Speaking about food insecurity, because I completely forgot about that, um, what is several things that you guys are doing? Because, you know, that can be a mental health situation as well with food insecurity during the pandemic. You know, if um, even though grocery stores haven't been closing, however, uh, people are hoarding, um, I hate using that word, but like going a little bit 
strange with the toilet paper and certain products that people are trying to get and can't get during the pandemic, um, paper products, etc. Um, and the food insecurity is a big thing. So what's one of the things that you guys are doing with that through this COVID situation? Um, I, I can address that a little bit. Um, well, first of all, the, uh, um, the Sunrise Wellness Program, our, our day program that Keith's alluded to a couple of times, uh, did a, an amazing uh, Thanksgiving dinner uh, where they had either dropped off or had people pick up at the location. And I think they served uh, about 100 people or close to 100 people. Mm -hmm. um, and then they did it again for Christmas, which was it, the numbers were even higher. Um, you know, they, they made everything themselves. Uh, the other thing is our children's program. Um, we generally, I think we were serving about uh, two meals a day to about 50, 60 kids. Uh, that jumped in a matter of weeks to becoming an open food source uh, site. Um, and we went from... Is, is that, is that in, food. I'm is sorry, that, is that, um, I apologize, is that, that's in Washington County? Yes, so that, yes, yeah, it's yeah. right here in Barrie, actually. Uh, right up the road from our offices, our administrative offices. And that went from five days a week, two meals a day to uh, three plus meals a day, because they actually included a snack uh, seven days a week. And the number I believe was, was tickling uh, about 300 people. Uh, so mm -hmm. that grew pretty dramatically. And, um, and so that really helped a lot, a lot of folks uh, that were uh, food insecure and struggling, uh, whether it was through job loss or whatever the case may be, while also uh, still taking care of the kids that we served so uh, on a daily basis and then some. Um, now, hmm. sometime back, I, I'm probably doing two topics here, but sometime back, um, yeah, I'm going to do like two topics in one. Now, as far as the COVID and ambulances, and stuff how are like with mental health um is our ambulances and police departments uh because i know you guys have team two how is that working within the COVID? is that working in diff uh, differently uh than because you know i know people are wearing masks and social distancing but how how is that working um uh, within the COVID situation is that not working or working the team two um yeah that, that is absolutely um in play uh lawrence and continues to work when when we first had the virus outbreak um things were remote there as well and emergency services along with police um were not responding as much out in the community but mm -hmm. when they do respond um and are out much more now. They respond together. In fact, we have a clinician that works within both the Barry and Montpelier police departments. So that uh, is, we now have the ability to go out with the police, rolling right out with them in the vehicle um, if uh, there is something going on in the community where a person's struggling. Um, but the emergency services team uh, continues to respond um, off hours and during the day uh, for additional supports uh, with the police. And they, they just respond in their own vehicles. Um, you know, if uh, they do their social distancing, they wear their masks, they are very careful uh, around that. But yes, um, the idea there with Team 2, which you mentioned, is for both police and mental health to work together to help a person to get what they need in the community. Now, Keith, how, explain more about how your um, how your day program is really working during the pandemic. Um, you know, through crisis intervention, through other things uh, that you might that you probably haven't mentioned. Go ahead. Sure. So because we could no longer have, uh, you know, a bunch of individuals all be at the same place at the same time in our day program, we really converted rather quickly to doing a more outreach model. So our staff are calling out to people and, and what we're doing in terms of like identifying individuals that are 
in need is it's it's a close relationship between the screeners, so our emergency personnel, our case managers, and our Sunrise program. And we have we keep like so when people are struggling, what we're doing is saying, okay, so we really we don't want people to have to go into the hospital because of their mental health crisis. So what we're doing is in an active way, instead of waiting for people to call, we have a list of people that we're calling every day. And our, our peer support um, team is really taken on uh, that work, really embrace that work. So we have a, a Maple House peer um, crisis bed and the staff that are uh, on the, on shift, they actually have a list of people that they're calling out to every single night to sort of check in on and make that connection because uh, people are really, really struggling. So that, that's been a pretty significant shift for us um, during COVID. Our, our response, our, our peer response line and our whatever has mostly been reception. People will call us. We're now actually actively outreaching to people um, when they're uh, through whatever means, whether that's through the screeners or through case management, have identified, oh, this person really needs some support. So that's a big, that's a big shift for us. Um, how has the screeners been working during COVID, you know, because a screener basically, you know, because I mean, we've spoken about this before on the show. Um, if someone needs help, they call a screener um, and then the screener determines what services they need. So how, how has that been working? Continues to that we continue to do the, just what you said, Lawrence. So, um, you know, that, that particular emergency services line gets about 14,000 calls a year. And, and uh, you know, they talk to people if they, um, you know, if we have a surge and they can't see someone, they're, they're, they may see them in the emergency room remotely, but right now they're back into the emergency room. So, or, or out in the community if they need to be, um, you know, they're doing what they need to do and they do have to have special accommodations sometimes if there is a surge or there's a situation that might not be safe with too many people, you know, they just have to flex, um, but they are absolutely there, maybe on the phone, maybe on a video, um, maybe face-to-face, they're having to make those decisions as they go. But the 24 seven emergency service response is absolutely there. Okay. Is there they're any, very busy and they're very busy as we said. <laughs> is there any service that we did not mention? I mean, we have about 18 minutes left. Um, but is there any services that we did not mention that's uh, real important uh, that either isn't running or well, because certain brick and mortar stuff isn't running, but um, um, is that going to change in in the next uh, couple of weeks? Uh, I don't think we have anything with that we've closed other than our congregate settings. Uh, and um, so what we don't have is an active bunch of people all the time in our buildings because that wouldn't be safe. So we're still really careful about um, our footprint as, as has been mentioned within the building. And when people come in our buildings, there's a process just like when you go to the doctor's office of taking your temperature and answering a few questions about where you've been. So if uh, clients come in um, perhaps for a meeting or an appointment to be seen face to face, they have to go through those safety uh, questions and protocols, but we're, we're open. Um, one thing I would love to talk a little bit about is housing and homelessness and some of the uh, special things that we've done there, because as I am sure you know, we have a number of people in our region who are homeless and living yes. in hotels. And yeah serve a lot of those folks. Um, and we also are always very, very invested in housing. And I'm going to, again, pass the hat here um, to uh, perhaps let Keith talk about some of the innovative things that we're doing to create housing. Yeah, Thanks, Mary. Uh, so, you know, you, you had said what would have sort of closed down. And yes, our, our day programs aren't operating like they, they were prior to uh, COVID. However, we've actually expanded um, 
during COVID uh, into housing. And the way that we're expanding here in the community support program is that we are providing more peer supported community based housing supports uh, to individuals. And we actually have uh, three programs right now that uh, that started right before COVID and, and actually have expanded throughout COVID. Uh, and one is the tiny homes. And we now have two units plus an apartment uh, in Barrie that is supported by a peer. So this is a person with lived experience. Uh, so we have one, two, three residents there. And we've also developed a single room occupancy peer supported housing unit in Barrie. So there's four individuals that are housed there. And we just started today, Mary, first resident moved in today into uh, what's referred to as Arid House. And that's also in Barrie. And Arid House is a place for, uh, for individuals who have experienced and continue to experience sub both substance use and mental health challenges. Uh, it's a dry house and we have a peer uh, with lived experience as a person. Okay. Who's uh, what is it? I apologize. Um, there's some acronyms there that I need to. Um, sure. What's a dry house? You mentioned a dry house. A dry house is there's no drugs or alcohol on premises. Okay. So the so the 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 program is designed for individuals who have struggled with drugs and alcohol and who need to live by their own choice need to live in a place where there's not going to be uh, drugs and alcohol around. But okay. Survival. And a single room occupancy is what. So it's one room. So it's a the house has one, two, three, four, five bedrooms in it with a shared um, living space, like a shared kitchen, shared uh, living area, shared TV. So everybody has their own room, but there's a shared space, and uh, we have a peer staff uh, who lives on premises to provide emotional and social support to the individuals that uh, live there. Mm -hmm. um, no. As far as homelessness, ha, these new programs, ha, has it like, because I, I don't know if homelessness has gone away, but um, what other things have you guys been, besides all of this, um, are you guys putting more, ho more housing into play because of the pandemic? Or because I know, yeah, a lot of people are, according to what Good Samaritan has told me, in the past, um, a lot of people are still in hotels. So what are you guys, uh, what more stuff are you guys doing? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that. So homelessness has absolutely not gone away. In fact, we have more people in counts than I think we have had in the past. So we, as of say last week, there are 346 people in our region that are in hotels with vouchers and uh, about 80 of those are children, Lawrence. So we need to work together as community providers. And what we're doing is joining other community providers like Downstreet Housing and Capstone Community Services, the Family Center, the Good Samaritan, um, you know, Washington County Youth Service Bureau, uh, and another way, um, meeting regularly together to make a plans for our region to try to brainstorm how do we find and more housing, work with landlords. And that's what we're doing in the program that Keith mentioned. We, we haven't purchased anything. We're renting a building and from a landlord who um, is uh, willing to sign a master lease with us because there is a support person living within that house. And so what we're doing is try and create relationships that landlords feel are trustworthy so that, uh, and they know we're there in the background to follow up. Um, so if we could do more of these, we absolutely will. And we're all about partnerships because we don't have big housing money. We don't have a bunch of dollars for housing. We've created housing over the years with partners like uh, like Downstreet, like the Vermont Housing Conservation Board that gives out money. Um, and that has helped us to build the housing portfolio that we have to help people be housed. So yes, people we serve, and then we're responding to the hotels um, with our case managers to give support to the folks there and then working with them on finding housing. Uh, you mentioned voucher. Uh, which um, our viewers might not know what that is. What exactly 
is a house is a hotel voucher i know it's a small question you guys but. want me to take a stab at that <laughs> okay there are different kinds um there are shelter plus care there are subsidy plus care and plus care um, it means that the government has uh, given us Medicaid dollars essentially for housing funds um, if there is a service component to the housing dollars. So there's some dollars that will come into the state and be matched um, and by the feds, and that allows an individual who is eligible for the voucher, meaning they have re they they meet certain criteria. They haven't, you know, they uh, they they have a, a diagnosis of a mental health challenge, or uh, you know, uh, um, have been in the hospital uh, frequently. There are different criteria, and they then can get a voucher that helps them with housing, and it pays for it. Essentially, pays for it or a part of it. And then there's Section Eight which has uh, been around for a real long time. A lot of our folks have Section 8 housing, um, which is another category. It's just different categories of housing support with dollars to help people pay for their rent. Okay, now, um, I know that during the pandemic, um, I don't know if it's Bernie's office doing this or the federal government. I know people that are on SNAP are getting more SNAP, um, you know, food, um, food stamps. If you have a mental health diagnosis, do you get more food stamps or more food health due to the pandemic or yes, no? Uh, I don't believe so. No, I think that's, you know, that's related to income. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so you know, that doesn't change, hasn't changed during the pandemic. Mary Kay, you're nodding. I'm going to let you speak to it. Exactly what Mary has spoken to, that um, SNAP eligibility is based on what your income is. And of course, our folks, if they're in that income back bracket, will be able to get SNAP, but they won't get any more than what somebody else would get. Um, so we're, but we are also working very closely with our folks to make sure that they are getting it yeah. and they're getting yeah. supported. So you help them like if they, during the pandemic, if someone's social security stops or other federal program stops, you help them fill out applications. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That's what we're there for. And we're checking in with our consumers on a weekly basis and sometimes on a daily basis to see where they're at, where their families are at, and what issues might be coming up even with home providers. So we're, again, it's that communication. Uh, John, is there anything you wanna to add to this since we have a little time left? Um, yeah, I guess just sort of reflecting on the homelessness piece, um, you know, there are a number of our, um, our staff right now, they're actually gonna be doing some training. Um, we just completed a survey recently um, to get a sense of what people's knowledge were about resources that were out there. Uh, so there's training that's happening. Um, I think it's actually going to be happening towards the latter part of this month, if not the beginning of next month. Um, so that again, we can gauge the knowledge of resources that are available to the homeless population, uh, so that our staff can direct those folks that are in need to those resources and help facilitate that as part of their case management work. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that uh, is, is being newly implemented and, and, I think it's going to have a pretty tremendous impact. Um, Well, you know, we, other than our congregate settings, we're open, we're open a hundred percent. There's no person that comes to our door that doesn't get a service. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it's the way 
that they might receive that service. So we didn't talk about therapy, for example. Yeah, we yeah. have outpatient therapy division. And if a person goes there, if they need to be seen face to face, they will be. But there are a lot of those clinicians, those counselors that work remotely now, because again, we have we had a building full of the full of full of clinicians, and we had to reduce the footprint so that we're not you know, too close to one another, that's dangerous. So some of those folks are working from home on a regular basis, but they can stay connected um, to their clients and that's what they do. Yeah, and well, just to add to that, Lawrence, you know, and, and Keith sort of alluded to this before, you know, just from a statistics standpoint, um, you know, I guess, I guess a couple of few years ago, we made a, a significant investment in a technology platform uh, that enabled us to move from basically zero telehealth um, particularly in the area that Mary was talking about, uh, just to give you some numbers. So in the first couple of weeks, we had um, 1,100 telehealth meetings. This is in two weeks. Uh, 1,100 two telehealth weeks. meetings in, wow. within a two-week period. We went. I think it was from, um, well, for example, like CCPS, mm -hmm. or Center for Counseling and Psychological Services. I think they were doing like zero telehealth. And right. Went, like pretty much about 100%. So they were able to migrate all of their on the people that they were working with and serve um, to some form of telehealth. So we really didn't see a lot of a huge drop off at that point. Um, that 1100 telehealth meetings uh, accounted uh, for 150 minutes by over 4,500 participants. And that, that also takes into uh, account, you know, supervisory sessions and stuff like that amongst the clinicians. Mm -hmm. By that August, is, 19, like 150,000 minutes. Don't is that 150 minutes or 100? 150,000 minutes. Thousand minutes. Yeah. Right. By 4,500 people and 1,100 telehealth meetings. Now by August 19th, all right. Now, Grant, this is a few months ago, so you can imagine where the numbers are now. Um, they grew. Those numbers grew to 1.9 million minutes by 51,468 participants engaging 16,668 meetings. So, Whoa. That, and that was an honor. We stay in touch with that's our clients. That's a lot. That's we a stay lot. in touch with our clients, Lawrence. That, that's exactly <laughs> No, it. no, no, that's, no. That's good. That's, that's good. Though. You yeah. know, there was a period of time, if you guys remember, or Lawrence, if you remember, in June, things kind of loosened up a little bit because we were doing pretty well. So there was a little bit more face-to-face -face engagement, you know, for example, at, at our, our kids uh, program, um, you know, summer camps were happening. And so, and that was able to be done in a very safe environment. So during that period by August, by August 19th, you know, the numbers were probably down a little bit, but since the surge, it probably ramped back up big time. I, I can't imagine that we're like, you know, it's mm -hmm. numbers are virtually off the charts in, in terms of minutes, meetings, and participants. So we're still being able to deliver a majority of the services, whether, you know, mostly remotely by a telehealth. Uh, and as was already pointed out, um, you know, when necessary in, in a safe environment in a face to face capacity. So Wow, um, this has been a really good, um, uh, a really good show. And you guys provided a lot of information. Um, uh, can can we have that number one more time for people who want to contact Washington County Mental Health Place and the website? Absolutely. So it's uh, area code 802-229-0591. Mm -hmm. And it's W and our, our website is uh, WCMHS.org. Well, I would like to thank everyone for joining me on this edition of Ableton on Air. Uh, Arlene is not here today. Um, we would like to thank Washington County Mental Health uh, for sponsoring Ableton on Air and many, many, many others. Um, again, if you need help during the pandemic or need, or need help at all from Washington County Mental Health with their services or emergency services, you can contact Washington County Mental Health at 802 um, go ahead. What was that number again? Uh, 802. 802 229 0591. Okay. 802 229 0591 or www.wcmhs.org. That is www.wcmhs.org. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you 
next time on Able Then On Air. Major sponsors for Able Then On Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Food sponsors for Able Then On Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Able Then On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify.